I'm Lorraine Ballard Morrill, and it's my incredible pleasure to continue with our podcast series, 70th anniversary of WDAS, with the legendary Mimi Brown. Mimi, it's so good to speak to you and to have you share some of your history with this historic heritage station. Mimi, tell us, how did you get started in radio? Well, radio took a little um, a bit of time to get started, and I guess you can say that I was always into music, which is the main thing which led to radio. I always thought I would be the Black Carol King. You know, I guess Alicia Keys took my place, and I was too, and I, <laughs> I kind of missed the boat on that one, but... I started in the music industry working out of a recording studio, which was called Society Hill Sound. Mike Nice, who later on had a show called Dancing on Air, was running the manager of that studio, was running that studio. And when I was young uh, in high school, I would leave high school and go down to the recording studio at the age of 15. And then I would start playing music. And he loved my melodies and, and kind of liked my voice, too, because it was very Carol Kingish or, you know, kind of kind of folky, poppy, whatever. And um, and that's where I got the opportunity to meet um, Dr. Perry Johnson and Sonny Hobson, who happened to be um, two major DJs at the time. Mm. And so when you first had the opportunity to actually get on the air, there weren't very many women who were on radio at that time, right? No, there weren't very many women that were doing um, radio um, at that time. And I didn't start at DAS. I started at a rock station, which was WYSP. So there was Maureen Flaherty, who was on. I would fill in for her. Now on WDAS, there was Louise Williams. There was Mary Mason. And then there was me. And so uh, I was at YSP for a couple of years and um, left YSP and then was hired by DAS one week after I left. I have to uh, share a little personal story about you and your voice. Um, when I was um, actually laid off from a job in radio, I was listening to DAS a lot, and I listened to you a lot. And I thought, oh my gosh, Mimi Brown has the most gorgeous voice in radio. Your voice was so beautiful, so rich. And that was really uh, a very striking memory for me was listening to you on WDAS in the early 80s. Yes, I think that you have to take time, as we all know, to develop that voice, which is your radio voice or that other voice that is inside of you. There's a voice that we have when we speak to our girlfriends, kind of high-pitched or with a family. But there's another voice that needs articulation and the correct pronunciation. And that's what I had to practice to find that inner voice. And that took a long time. So I guess I made a lot of my mistakes at YSP <laughs> and got better at WDAS. Yeah. Well, your uh, career in radio has very much tied in with the music business in Philadelphia and in the nation. And I wonder if you could share with us some stories of artists that you had, you know, connections with that you had partnerships with. Well, you know, there are many, many artists um, that uh, you come in um, contact with when you're in this business. And those that were like major friends of mine and major connections, we can go with Dexter Wanzell, um, who worked for Philadelphia International Records and um, Cynthia Biggs. And I was always over Dexter's house and um, and listening to music. Oh, Steve Green from Breakwater. I remember when I used to do a club and I used to do Kim Grace on Thursday night and we called it Thursday night of the stars and all the stars would come through whether it be basketball players football players and major stars from Bonnie Pointer and you can name them everybody's Teddy Pendergrass everybody stopped by you know just to be amongst the who's who Butterball was there all the radio personalities Rolls Royce Howard Call Helm you know the list, not Georgie Woods too much but Kenny Gamble Leon Huff would stop by there because they liked to hear the music 
everybody wanted to be in tune to the music, but you meet a lot of people. And so Dexter was a major because I got a chance to listen to his music. People always wanted me to hear their music prior to them putting it out or select the single. And I would say, okay, there it is. And then that's the single right there. And then that's the single they would present not only to the radio stations, but also present to the record company. So they were good friends. What were some of the songs or artists that you feel like you've had an influence with and vice versa? Um, that I had an influence with, uh, definitely uh, Dexter Wanzell and Cynthia Biggs um, uh, with Breakwater as well. Um, I mean, Captain Sky, Brandy Wells, um, there's a lot. Um, Eugene Wilde, um, um, I, I wish it was Luther. <laughs> I wish I could say that. I think that our relationship was just a business relationship. And when he got when he got a chance to uh, be interviewed by me for his business to to expound his career because DAS was a major station. Um, other relationships that uh, people that I met along the way there weren't relationships, but people that I met along the way were of course the Jacksons and my, including Michael Jackson and interviewed them. Um, Jermaine Jackson several times because he put out a few albums and he always came to WDAS. Marlon Jackson, uh, Latoya Jackson, Butterball took that one. <laughs> he said, Latoya, I got to have Latoya. And mm-hmm. what a precious person she was to interview. And so um, there's so many. Um, we can go into the rap groups, whether it's a Run DMC, Big Daddy Kane, Heavy D and the Boys, um, MC Light, you know, um, Will Smith. Um, and also Jazzy Jeff, Cash Money, um, um, Malika Love. Uh, I can go on and on. The list is really long. Queen Latifah, the first one to bring her here um, to Philadelphia, Public Enemy. I mean, the list is very extensive. Whitney Houston, I interviewed her on her first album. Um, Gerald Avert, I interviewed him the first time he opened up with an album. Um, and his daddy came with him to the studio of WDAS. And that was a relationship that was ongoing. I think that a lot of my relationships with musicians um, continued to be professional. And they always wanted to know what their music um, sounded like and uh, how I felt about it. Was it marketable? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, it can be said that you had a huge influence on hip hop music, bringing it to... Philadelphia, bringing it to the airwaves and helping to popularize a lot of those hip hop artists that now we consider to be, you know, some of the greats. But you see, it's all about helping each other. Uh, Women need to reach out, not be against each other, but to continue to help each other in order to grow. Um, And sometimes, unfortunately, when you're the first doing it, you don't always get the respect that you might get later on down the line. Yeah, for sure. I totally understand that. I wonder if you can talk about how you feel WDAS fits into the flow of of the city of Philadelphia, what it means to people to listen to WDAS. For so many years, we're celebrating 70 years. That's a long, long time. And I wonder if you can talk about what DAS means to people. When I first came to WDAS, I've been through a few like cycles of different um, personalities and the station changes. So when I came to WDAS, AM was everything. So on AM, it was Georgie Woods in the morning singing, Oh Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan. And um, and I had a fill-in, a fill-in sometimes. And then my fill-in was usually on the weekends. I did a sale Sunday and Saturday on the weekends. But sometimes I would fill in for Brother Nicaea. There was um, uh, Jim Jim White that was on, and then it was Brother Nicaea that was on. And I would do fill-ins overnight. But when I got off at 5 o'clock in the morning, here comes Georgie Woods. And I had to make Georgie Woods coffee. Now, here I am thinking that I'm all that on the radio. But I got to get Georgie Woods coffee with 16 sugars. And I just thought 16 (laughs) sugars was way too much for anybody. (laughs) One day, one morning, he told me to make his coffee, cream, and don't forget his 16 sugars. And I went in there and I said, that's just too much. I don't think this is really good for Georgie. So I put in 10. When I brought that cup back, he said, 
you didn't put in enough sugar. I said, 16. You put in almost, he said, a little bit more than half the amount. And I had to go back and, and, and put more sugar in the coffee. So when, you, when you're around the greats like that, like a Georgie Woods, the Carl Helms, and then came what they called the baby, David Bam, and then came Rolls Royce Howard. You know, they treated you like you really were just like a crumb on the table, really. It's like, you know, can I get any respect here? No, you're not going to get any respect here. And you walk by the offices of um, Jimmy Bishop, and you and there's the Butterballs, you know. I mean, and you're talking about Cody Anderson. It's like, my goodness, you know, will you ever get a break? Will anybody ever see you as a human being? Louise Williams saw me. Mm -hmm. Louise Williams recognized what it is that I was going through. And she not only worked AM, but she also worked FM at the time. And during that time with Dr. Perry Johnson, Tony Brown, Wayne Joel, Primus Robinson, with a whole different sound, a whole different flow, because the 70s and the 80s just had a different vibe to it. And believe me, they had a vibe. <laughs> with the exception of Louise, which was like, they were all about themselves, you know? They were so cool like that. It's kind of like watching a Superfly movie or something. And who were you on the totem pole in terms of myself? I was another little crumb on the table. So it was hard to get the respect that I wanted, but eventually it did come. And so when you think about WDAS, going back to your question, it has been the fabric of our city. It has been the place where everyone went, not just people that were African-American or people that are brown or, or people that are black or people of color. It's where everybody went to hear great music and also get the information that we needed to know. And you know that, Lorraine, how important it is because, you know, as a news, um, as a newscaster, as also our public service um, director, and affairs and dealing with the affairs of the world and also the city, it's really impactful what it is that you say and bring to the table. So I give you your kudos for everything that you bring to the table because it's so needed. But that's what DAS, it, was, it wasn't just a want, it was a need. It's something that we had to have as part of our lives and then it was embedded into the community. Mimi, one of the things that I have to say is that you exude such positivity you have kind of a glow about you, and, and you're such a very loving person. Um, I, I am relatively late in the game of knowing Mimi Brown. I didn't know you in your earlier career. But I do know this, that you've certainly gone through your ups and your downs. But you've come to the other side of all of that with this very beautiful spirit of generosity and kindness and support. And I wonder if you can maybe share with us a little bit about how you come to be Mimi Brown, the Mimi Brown that I know. Well, I always um, looked at everything that has happened to me, eventually, not always at the time, you know, broken marriage that didn't go well, things that happened in my career that didn't go well, that were upsetting. Um, not being recognized, people stealing your ideas and saying it's their own when it really was yours. Um, uh, you know, kind of being the last one on the totem pole and have to fight really hard. You have to fight really hard as a woman during the time that I came up in order to be recognized, to get your position, to hold your position on the radio. Because I, uh, I lived my life, unfortunately, at that time as one day, one second at a time. You like you watch the clock when you're on the radio. It's the seconds. It's the quarter hour. I, that's how I live my life. So I've, I always have been uncomfortable. I still am to this day. A sense of being uncomfortable about where I am. But we. Um, but when it came to the things that have that could have broke me all the way, I realized that nothing is going to take away the love that's in my heart for another human being. And that's what has kept me going, the love for another human being. We all make mistakes. We all go through something. But I always see something in that individual. But what I have learned is that everybody may not require your time and all of your help. I have exuded myself and given myself to a lot of people 
where I didn't really have, where I could have really helped someone else that could have appreciated it a little bit more. Um, so I learned kind of the whole back. And like the, the word says, you know, you pick your battles, right? So I want to make sure that I choose wisely when it comes to the giving of your gift. And so that it's not thrown away and so that someone can use it. I was so blessed by having, sure, I call them my children in my life. Right now, I think it's at 11 <laughs> that I was able to help guide along the way. They're all, each and every one of them have never been in trouble, have, are extremely successful. So they, to me, are my true example of the love that I have in my heart because they definitely love me back. Yeah. Well, Nimi Brown, I wonder if you can um, share with us any points in your career that really stand out, things that really just were so memorable and so amazing because I'm sure you've had the many of those moments but share with us a couple of those moments that really stand out in your career at WDAS. You know it's so many that it's hard to, to pinpoint what they are um, a, because there's so many so let's go through a few. Um, doing the Teddy Pendergrass album, Live Coast to Coast. Um, when Kenny Gamble, Leon Hub asked for me to be on that album to do an interview, I was elated and so scared. But when I got into the studio and I noticed that Teddy was nervous too, I said, wow, how can Teddy Pendergrass be nervous? I'm nervous. So we were both nervous together and we kind of giggled about it. But we're in the studio and doing that interview on the album Live Coast to Coast um, for Luther Vandross to come in for my birthday and bring me roses and for the first time to be able to sing on the radio. He never sang on the radio and he had new equipment that no one has ever used. And he told who was working for him, he said, this better work because Luther was a perfectionist. Also to bring Prince, that was the first one to bring Prince um, into this area. I was doing a club called Emerald City, which was the old Latin casino and they turned it into a club and that was in Jersey. And I brought Prince in and to be able to bring him in for Prince to turn out the way he turned out, I think was pretty phenomenal. Whitney Houston, um, the first time on her first album when she came in to interview her, to interview Stephanie Mills, to interview the Jacksons um, when they came in and to interview Michael Jackson. You know, seeing them at such a beautiful time of their lives and career and that for them to come to the city of Philadelphia and see that, you know, Kenny Gamble and Leon enough could take them to another level and, 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 the, and stretch them further and let their dreams come true and let the Philadelphia be a part of that, um, you know, was pretty amazing. Um, finally being embraced <laughs> by the gentleman because it took call him eight years to talk to me or nine. And literally, he wouldn't talk to me ever. Hello, call him. He just turned away and keep on going. When he spoke to me, I thought I would fall on the floor because finally being recognized and given the respect, which took years in order for that to happen um, at WDAS by the men that were there. As a woman, you're in a man's world. If you're the if you're only woman doing what I was doing, Louise Williams had gospel. She was queenie. Nobody touched her. She was, she was responsible for Jimmy Bishop being there, for Butterball being there. Nobody touched queenie. So she was on a different kind of level. But I'm the girl who came from the clubs. I don't know any other women that, did, or that were club DJs prior to radio, you know, and prior to me. And so when I'm coming from the clubs, it's like coming from the streets. You know what I'm saying? So when you come from the streets, it's like very little respect. When you finally get that respect from your program director, from your general manager, and your other co-workers that happen to be men, that is a moment. Now, that is a precious moment there. <laughs> Amy Brown, I know that uh, throughout your career, you've had a lot of people that have been supportive, and certainly a lot of folks right now. So why don't you uh, tell us who, who you'd like to shout out? You know, for one is my brother, Cutmaster Butter, and all the DJs who have worked in clubs like me. You, I carried the records for Dr. Perry Johnson, and Cutmaster Butter carried the records for me. And so there's a long line of DJs that have worked in the clubs and were able to work their way into um, radio stations. And I'm so proud of them. Cutmaster Butter, Andre the Giant, um, DJ Doc B, 
also DJ Cosmic Kev, Don Mystic Mac, uh, Steve Mason. And if I forgot anyone, uh, don't blame it on my heart. Just blame it on my mind. I love you, little Rain, and I thank you so much. My last question is, what does WDAS mean to you? Music. I couldn't live without it. Music has been um, the comfort of my heart. Music is just as much a part of me as the blood that runs through my veins. DAS has been um, the vehicle that allowed me to live through the music, allowed me to survive and be happy and joyful through the music, allow the times that we live in, whether it was then or whether it's now, through the music, we continue to learn. And I'm so grateful for it. DAS is more than just a radio station. It is a part of our community that is needed and continues to be needed. And that's obvious from the amount of people that listen to us each and every day. Each and every air personality that is on there right now serves a, a great purpose and holds you know, a great honor in those that listen to them. And I'm so extremely proud of Steve Harvey of Patty Jackson, of Frankie Darcell, of Adimu. And, um, and we keep our prayers in for Tony Brown each and every day. I'm so proud of Doug Henderson, of his accomplishments and what his father has done and the Gary Shepherds and, and those that have been there before me and those that will continue to be there after me. But they have a hard, hard one to follow. And all I got to say is follow the path of the greats and you can't lose. Well, you are one of the greats, Mimi Brown, as we celebrate WDAS's 70th anniversary. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Well, what a pleasure. Uh, Lorraine, I adore you. I admire you. Please continue to do what you do because we embrace you. And thank you for being a part of our community, a part of our station, and being our friend and our sister at WDAS 105.3. Love you. I love you too.